And I was telling Dr. Mintz, we were talking about appearing on this, because I do a lot of things around town. And if you can write 50 books and nobody recognizes you, you have one 30-second appearance on the news, and the next day people will stop you in the supermarket and say, I saw you on television last night. It's an amazing phenomenon of validation, you know? Bizarre. So, thanks, Dean. Uh, uh, did I make any sense, by the way? Did it make any sense what I said? Okay. There has been no more powerful force for social change in the 20th century than the mass media. The mass media have helped to shape our ideas of beauty, masculinity, femininity, social class, sophistication, and above all, our place in the world. And fitting that such a powerful force exists, it has also been the most uh, controversial topic in the 20th century. To cultural conservatives, the mass media has produced a non-discriminating audience, which is passive, that simply takes in and readily accepts the ideas disseminated by various cultural elites. And so the mass media can be blamed for a decline in literary standards, a decline in cultural literacy, in short, for an increasingly dehumanized population. Now, on the left, there are also cultural critics, and they also condemn mass media. They argue that the mass media has deadened people's perceptions, that it has encouraged passivity, that it has de-radicalized the working class. And what we're going to do for the remainder of this afternoon is to treat all of these ideas very, very seriously. We are going to look at the mass media's role in the 20th century as myth maker. Now, myths are a peculiar topic to talk about. We usually think of myths as stories that were told long ago, for example, in ancient Greece or ancient Rome. But here I'm going to argue that myths remain extremely important. These are standardized stories that very much help us navigate in the world in which we live. And we are going to look at the single most important myth in the 20th century in the United States, the myth of the frontier and the embodiment of that myth, the cowboy. And we're going to see how that myth was created and then even further how it has actually shaped politics throughout the 20th century. So myths are not just entertainment, I'd argue. They are the vehicles by which ideologies are carried, and therefore they have the power to motivate even great societies. If we could have the uh, computer screen, please. Let's begin with the most popular actor in American history. His name, of course, is John Wayne. John Wayne has been dead for many years, yet in the last public opinion poll asking who the number one favorite box office star is in the United States, the answer was, of course, John Wayne. Wayne was the embodiment of the American myth. He was a man of instinct, a man of independence, a man in touch with nature, a man distrustful of government, of institutions, and experts. This was the 
true American. Now, he wasn't always John Wayne. He was born Marion Michael Morrison, not an appropriate name huh, for someone like him. Of all places, he was born in Iowa in 1907. But gradually, over time, he became the symbol of the West. Honest, brave, upright, and true. He even looked like the Western landscape. He was oversized, he was strong, he was tough, he was powerful, he was dramatic. At first, there was a sort of softness to John Wayne's features, but over the years, he lost that smooth, fresh handsomeness of his youth. His hair fell out, his waist thickened, his face became lined and weathered, but did he uh, go have an operation? Not a bit, because the changes made him look more like our mythic image of the West than when he was younger and more handsome. His face took on the chiseled features of Mount Rushmore, just as we could not imagine Abraham Lincoln as a handsome youth, one could not imagine John Wayne that way either. Now, John Wayne was not always popular, and he was not always popular with all Americans, especially in the late 1960s and 1970s. No one, no one seemed more out of step with the times as John Wayne. We were living in a period of radical social and cultural change, and John Wayne was seen as a modern-day Neanderthal. He could never be politically correct. You could not imagine him keeping up with the fashions of the times. Uh, one can't think of John Wayne wearing bell-bottom trousers. But he had always played the same kind of characters in the movies, and just because the times they were a-changing doesn't mean that John Wayne would change. Since the 1920s, he had starred in over 150 movies. And he always played more or less the same character. He was the independent man of action, the man who rides tall in the saddle, who confronts evil on deserted streets at high noon, whose job it is to protect innocent women, children, and men. About his character, he never seemed like a really nice guy. He was John Wayne. He was surly. He was rough and tough. He used coarse, blunt language. He was a sort of bull in the china shop. And in the face of the feminist revolution of the late 1960s and early 1970s, John Wayne seemed to be particularly out of date. He was patriotic at a time when many Americans, angry over the Vietnam War, viewed patriotism as naive and even dangerous. John Wayne was an embodiment of individuality of raw individualism. But America was becoming an organized society, a bureaucratic society. Uh, there was no place for John Wayne's laissez-faire individualism in the new era when the best and the brightest knew how to engineer our society for everyone's benefit. 
and John Wayne's political attitudes were not those that seemed fashionable in the age of liberalism. Uh, he deplored coddling criminals. He opposed welfare programs. He said, I don't go along with this new thing of genuflecting genu to the downtrodden. But if liberals condemned John Wayne, conservatives embraced his values. And for many more millions of Americans who held no political opinions of their own, John Wayne was the American ethos. He was the symbol of who we were, are, or should be. He was tall. He was rugged. He was forthright. He was independent. He's what you mean when you say American and smile when you call me that. To America and the world, John Wayne was the embodiment of America and particularly the frontier. In his films, you can always tell an Easterner because Easterners are corrupt and Easterners are effete. They're people with power, but it's power that's always abused. It's power that's used against the people. In contrast, Westerners are freedom-loving. They're independent sorts. They're people who only want to escape the domination of Eastern bankers, and land agents, and bureaucratic officials, and who would be against that? So Wayne was truly the symbol of America. And when Americans still say he's their favorite actor after all these years, what they're saying is that to most Americans, John Wayne's their idealized self-image of themselves and of their country. He's fearless. He's feared by others. He may be a killer, but that's because the world has things that need killing. He may be rootless. He may not have a family or traditional family values, but he has something better. He has his own internalized code of honor. And so I introduce you to John Wayne with a purpose. John Wayne became the personification of an American myth, an American self-image. And every society has such myths. Every society has stories and characters and images that contain those societies' basic lessons. These Stories, these images, are the essence of our worldview. We pick them up piece by piece from the time we're little, and over time they become the very bedrock view of common sense reality. Now what we're going to see is these myths, as I call them, are not simply the creation of a culture industry. These myths are usually rooted in genuine historical experience. They don't come out of nowhere. Societies have experiences, and then these myths rise around them. But what's interesting to me, and I hope is interesting to you as well, is that these myths outlive their historical reality. They survive the world that produces them, and they continue to influence a new world. 
So it's not just that John Wayne is dead, but the frontier itself has been dead for a hundred years. But it doesn't make any difference because in the most important reality, the reality of our imaginations, it lives on as if the world had not changed a bit. Now, let me go on. In complex societies like the one we live in, myth-making does not take place because of casual conversations around campfires. Myth-making is a business, just like any other business in our society. And so we have, in a complex society like ours, a genuine culture industry, an industry that is responsible for writing our myths and distributing our myths and making, convincing us that we want to see those myths either on our television set or at the movies. And as Professor Jowett showed us earlier, it was in the late 19th century that this culture industry arose. It was between the Civil War and World War I that a culture industry became capable of influencing thinking in every part of the nation. That no class, no ethnic group, and no region would be immune to the influence of this new culture industry. And in the 20th century, of course, no part of the Western world would be free of its influence either. It took a while, but by the 1920s, this cultural industry totally dominated American national culture. It was responsible for creating and disseminating our dominant myths, our dominant ideologies. Now, many people often fear that the mass media acts on a passive audience, that the mass media somehow brainwashes people just as North Korea apparently brainwashed American servicemen prisoners of war during the Korean War. But I don't think that's how the mass media in fact functions. In a modern, commercialized society, you have to sell people something that they want. You want to get as large an audience as is imaginable. And you can't do that unless you respond to the audience's needs and the audience's desires. Now, I would argue, of course, that the audience is often unconscious of those needs, desires, fantasies, and anxieties. And the genius of the culture industry is to look at all of us straight in the eye and uncover our weaknesses, uncover our needs, uncover our confusions, and uncover our fantasies, and therefore address them. Indeed, I would go even a step further than that. The people who dominate the culture industry are not a random cross-section of the American population. And this is not to say that that's a bunch of East Coast Efeet intellectuals. Rather, it's a relatively small group of people I mean, several thousand, who are well-educated, tend to be relatively affluent by the standards of our society, who are very interested in things like psychological self-awareness. Uh, these people are the ones who shape our myths. And among this group, there is no affirmative 
action. I mean, this is a group of people who are extremely talented, but tend to come from a relatively small cross-section of the population. Screenwriters, novelists, artists, these are the people who shape our mass culture and therefore shape our imaginations. They're not living among us. They're not taking classes among us. And so they all stand at a distance from their audience, and they must guess at what the audience wants. Again, people aren't sitting around the campfire and they can't look in your eyes. All they have is the Nielsen ratings and the box office figures for each week, and it's out of that that they guess what Americans are interested in, that and their own personal experience. But when you make a movie these days, the average amount of money you spend is $40 million. And even after many years of inflation, $40 million ain't chicken feed, as they say. It is a tremendous amount of money. So how do you succeed? How do you cut your risk? How do you try to make sure that that $40 million will be recouped so that you will have another chance to make movies? And the answer, I believe, the answer that you would get in a screenwriting class is don't simply write out of your own experience. Don't try to be wholly original. Instead, rely on cliches. In other words, do exactly the opposite of what I expect you to do on your final exam in this class. Uh, what advice the culture industry would give you would be to rely on conventions, on stereotypes, on genres, and on mythic images. In other words, popular culture is formulaic. It relies on a small number of conventions that are used again and again and again. Boy meets girl boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. Those kind of formulas are crucial, not simply because people love them and they love the familiar, but because those formulas are truly time-tested and they work more than other formulas. They're tried true in the marketplace. Okay. So if you wish to be successful, you will try out these formulas. And what we're going to do next is look at the most successful formula in all of American history, a formula that has fallen on hard times in recent years, but for a century was the most powerful the most successful set of images that the world had seen. It's the myth of the frontier. And since we live at a moment when that myth seems to be fading, though we'll talk about that a little bit later, it's, I think, a perfect moment to get some perspective on that myth. As I said, this country's basic, basic myth is the frontier, and our basic hero is the frontiersman. Man, I should add, though uh, on TV you could see Jane Seymour playing the frontier woman as well. Freedom in America is not freedom in the abstract. It's freedom under the open sky on the endless plains. And 
to become city-fied, to become a city slicker, is to lose touch with everything that is valuable in the world, even those of us who would never dream of living out on a farm or a ranch, still drive our pickup trucks and listen to country music and zip up our boots every morning because it's crucial to our self-image. In 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner, a historian, announced that the American frontier was closed, that we had run out of open space in this country, and the country went through a crisis, a crisis of confidence. And it was during that crisis of confidence that America found its true and lasting hero. It found the cowboy. Real cowboys were disappearing. But in our imagination, we were all cowboys, and that image would persist. Now, the frontier myth, I will argue to you today, presents a story of American history that Americans for a century found to be extremely compelling. It portrayed American history as a series of violent conflicts. These were conflicts between us and them. And these conflicts took a variety of forms. There was the conflict between us and an unfamiliar, dangerous environment, the frontier. There was a conflict between Westerners and Easterners. There was a conflict between frontiersmen and Indians. There were conflicts between good guys, bad guys. And above all, there was a conflict between civilization and savagery. All of American history could be understood in terms of these dualities, in terms of these oppositions. And the frontier was the place where these conflicts were worked out. The frontier was a moral jungle, a place where all the limits of law were suspended and the conflicts would be resolved typically in gun battle. Now, where did this mythic image of ourselves come from? It actually dates to the colonial period, but the person who was most important in formulating it in its modern form was a 19th century novelist named James Fenimore Cooper. You're all <coughs> excuse me, familiar with his works, whether you've read them or not, because he set up a set of stereotypes or archetypes that have continued in American history right down to today. The true American hero in his leather stocking tales is a man armed and alone. He is an ordinary man, but he's truly a natural aristocrat. He's also paired with a non-white companion. Okay. So you have Hawkeye and Chingachgook, but you'll have in American history the Lone Ranger and Tonto. You'll have many of these pairings in the future. And the basic Western story in Fenimore Cooper's works and in later works is the story of a kidnapping, of captivity, of a chase, and a rescue. So 
Cooper's hero is an American version of the old medieval knight riding on his horse, not with a lance, but with a pistol or a rifle. And this hero would become the model for all future heroes in American popular culture, whether they be trappers or scouts, cowboys or detectives or superheroes. These are the heroes of our imagination. Now, Cooper's books are not easy to categorize because they're not simply a celebration of frontier violence. They have a very peculiar tone to them, a tone of nostalgia and misgivings. If you actually read James Fenimore Cooper's books, you'll discover a sort of environmental consciousness in them. Uh, he's very hostile towards the violence directed at Native Americans. He's very critical of the materialism of American society. He regrets that most Americans aren't like Hawkeye, the American knight, wholly individualistic at home in the natural environment. Now, for Americans, the frontier has served a crucial function or set of functions in our imaginations. The frontier is a place where a man can rise above selfishness. It is a place where a man can redeem himself, overcome sloth, achieve renewal after financial bankruptcy or moral bankruptcy. The frontier is a garden of earthly delights. It's a place filled with fabulous wealth. But the West is also a safety valve. That is a place when you're dissatisfied with your city-fied life. You can always abandon the city and go off and find yourself on the frontier. So in America, you don't have to join the French Foreign Legion. All you have to do is shut your door, and get on your steed, and ride out west. But I want to argue with you today that the frontier myth doesn't simply serve psychological functions. In reciting the frontier myth, you do not simply free yourself from the frustrations of living in a bureaucratic world. I will argue that the frontier myth served a critical political function for Americans. It helped us see ourselves in a particular role in the world. Okay. According to the frontier myth, the most powerful myth in all of American history. All history is the struggle between advanced races and primitive races for the control of resources. So Karl Marx may say that all history is the history of class struggle. But our movies told a very different story. In our movies and our TV westerns, the struggle was a struggle between advanced and primitive races. And this ideology has served a very important function in America. It's helped to draw attention away from class conflict or gender conflict or any other kind of conflict. And Again, I would take this even a step further and argue to you that this frontier myth associates progress with the conquest, the subjection, and the death of non-white peoples. So when you watched a Western, 
You are not simply watching interesting entertainment that helped to allow you to escape an unpleasant present. When you watched westerns, you were also learning a lesson of history with certain implicit meanings. And I will argue that the frontier myth still colors the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at the world. Today, I'd argue that we in the United States see ourselves both as cowboys and as Indians. Uh, and it's not an accident that when Sylvester Stallone played John Rambo, he was half European, half Indian. That was the sort of culmination, the way we think of ourselves today. Now, you all probably know that back in 1961, the Democratic presidential nominee, John F. Kennedy, accepted the Democratic presidential nomination with some famous words. He said that America had to end eight years of drift and stagnation and enter a new frontier. And that idea that we need to find new frontiers to replace our old frontiers has all kinds of continuing significance for us in this country. 67 years before Kennedy had made that speech, Frederick Jackson Turner had argued that the conquest of the Western frontier was the nation's formative experience. It was the conquest of the frontier that had shaped Americans' character, that had shaped Americans' values. And throughout the 20th century, I would assert to you, the frontier has been a potent symbol that has been put to a wide variety of uses, both by liberals and conservatives, by political managers, by movie script writers, by advertisers. Uh, when Ford called that car the Mustang, they knew that they had appealed to a symbol of personal freedom, of nature, of authenticity, of resolve. In other words, when you appeal to the Western image, you're appealing to something very deep-rooted in the American psyche, something very deep-rooted in the American character. So when did this modern Western image first begin to dominate American culture? And the answer lies in the 1890s. Okay. And then it was a man named Buffalo Bill Cody who was able to transform America's love affair with the West into the stuff of popular entertainment. From 1883 to 1916, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, it wasn't called the Wild West Show, was the country's most popular form of commercial entertainment. Now, Buffalo Bill, to a certain extent, could actually speak about the West with some first-hand knowledge. He himself had been a trapper. He himself had been a soldier. He'd even been a Pony Express rider and an Army Scout and even a buffalo hunter who had killed hundreds of buffalo a day to feed railroad crews and Western soldiers. But what had made 
Buffalo Bill into a popular hero is that he was the first American soldier to wreck revenge for Custer's last stand. You'll recall in 1876, George Armstrong Custer and his entire contingent of men had been slain. The Battle of the Little Bighorn. And in the following battle, a young Buffalo Bill Cody had killed an Indian and scalped him. And so this had become featured in newspapers as the first scalp for Custer. And so he opened his Wild West show and Americans flocked to see it. But you actually had to go to his Wild West show and it wasn't everywhere in the country. Not everybody could fit in. They didn't have an Astrodome for people to go see it. This isn't like P.T. Barnum's circus. And so we had to find other ways of popularizing and disseminating the Western image. And the answer became the movies, the movies. The first of our cinematic cowboy heroes was named Bronco Billy Anderson between 1903 and 19. 20, he made more than 400 westerns. I mean, it's interesting. There's no single great western of the early period. It's just that people saw them again and again and again and again. None too great. But their cumulative influence was incredibly powerful. Over four thousand westerns were made between 1926 and 1967. That is fully one quarter of all the movies that were made in this country were westerns. In 1959 alone, a year I remember well, there were 48 western television series on at the same time time. That was the peak. Uh, and of course you might say that the interest in the Western has fallen off and there's no doubt that that's true. Uh, but twice in the 1990s Western films have won Academy Awards for Best Picture. You'll remember Dances with Wolves in 1990 and Unforgiven in 1992, and the 1995 winner, Brave Heart, used all of the Western's formula, only on a different frontier, not the American frontier, but another frontier. And so, I guess I try to suggest to you that for all the degree to which the Western has fallen into decline, it still remains our most powerful cultural myth. And the reason it does is, I think, quite simple and direct. That is, the Western encapsulates, epitomizes, the largest themes in American history. Our original sin of seizing land from Indians. The waves of migration westward first of trappers, then of herders, then of ranchers, then of farmers. The history of the West is also the history of technology in a funny way. Each phase of the West marks a new phase in technology, whether it's railroads or barbed wire or improved firearms or even oil. And in addition, the Western explores cultural conflict and the relationship between each individual and the larger community. So the West is an almost ideal blackboard because 
all of the themes that Americans are interested in can be played out on it. It's a screen on which we can examine our deepest concerns. So I think it's fair to say, based on all of this evidence, that for a century, the most important element in American popular culture has been the Western. And it is the Western more than anything else that has shaped our conception of manliness, loyal, committed to a code of honor, speaking softly but carrying a big stick, silent but rugged, handsome. The cowboy hero is, for many men, our idealized image of ourself. Now, the actual cowboy phase in American history was extraordinarily brief. If you wanted to study the cowboy era in American history, this paper would only cover the period from the mid-1860s to the mid-1880s, and then it was gone. In 1885-1886, there was a disastrous winter in the West in which over half of all the cattle died. And so it became clear you didn't want cattle living out on the open plains. Rather, you wanted them fenced in. And when that happened, the age of the cowboy had come to a close. Now, this country has had many colorful incidents in its past. You can think of riverboat pilots. You can think of whaler, harpooners, and the like, lumberjacks. And all of those earlier images, they tried to popularize. There's Moby Dick about whaling. Or uh, you go up to Wisconsin and you'll see statues of lumberjacks like Paul Bunyan, but they all have faded from our imagination. They're not very important to us. But the cowboy lived on in pulp novels, in films, in TV shows, and above all in the figure of John Wayne. Why do you think that is? Why this one image persisted when all the other interesting images in American history faded away. Any thoughts about that? Why this one? People play cowboys and Indians, but they don't play harpooner. Uh, why? Why do you think that might be? Any thoughts? <laughs> Press your button, please. Um, our country was settled, let me rephrase this, we, we came to a country of wilderness, supposedly, a country that was not like Europe. And yet, for many of us, including myself, uh, the frontier was gone after my family came. Uh, it was, you know, they, they, the, for them, the frontier experience was crossing the Atlantic, not crossing the prairies. I mean, it's an interesting issue, I think. Yes? I think it, have, it might have something to do with the, uh, the rescue, the, the rescue um, ideology, or the good versus bad, or... Yeah, I, I, I think this is a very difficult question to answer, and there's certainly no correct answers. But it's one I think it's worth engaging a bit and trying to think about. Now, our society's preoccupation with the Western frontier and the cowboy hero has very deep roots in our culture. It can be traced back as far as Daniel Boone or Hawkeye or Davy Crockett. So it has roots in our past. The Western is also bound up with our self-definition as a country with a frontier, a country with a unique civilizing mission that was God's country out there. We were here, here 
to build a city on a hill, a prosperous Eden, but to build that prosperous Eden, you had to kill all the dirty snakes. And also, we were a democratic, egalitarian society, and the West provided a screen on which we could play all that out. Uh, and so, I would argue to you that the dominant themes of the Western, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, these are the issues not only at the heart of our Constitution, but at the heart of the Western. The Western became a microcosm for all of our deep-seated concerns. Now, the frontier hero has proven to be remarkably flexible and adaptable. The frontier hero can be an enforcer of law and order and therefore a symbol of conservative values. But the Western hero can also be Jesse James, the bank robber who expresses lower class discontent with the division of wealth and power. So he can be a populist hero as well. The Western hero can be the individual who's resisting modernization. Or the flip side of that is the Western hero can be the person who makes the West safe for women, children, and progress. So one thing that's wonderful about the Western formula is it's remarkably adaptable. You can use it for whatever purposes you might wish. Now, it's not an accident, I would assert, that the very first film to tell a story was a Western. It was Edwin S. Porter's Great Train Robbery of 1903. And it's short, about 10 minutes long. And in it, you see all the stereotypes of all later Westerns. Sheriff, outlaw, bad Indian, good Indian, Mexican villain, heroic outlaw, desperate half-breed. So in just 10 minutes, you can see a lot of the stereotypes that American culture would later employ. And for then 30 years, from 1939 to 1969, the Western had truly its golden age, beginning with a movie with John Wayne called Stagecoach. And then for three decades, the Western was the most consistently popular and widely produced form of action movie. And as I've tried to suggest, it was the most significant film for the creation of public myth and public mythology. It tells the story of the forces of corruption versus civic virtue. It's about rugged individualism versus the refinement of civilization. It's the struggle against a racially alien enemy. And so if you went to the movies every Saturday afternoon, weekend after weekend, year after year, gradually that ideology would imprint itself in your brain. The Western built national solidarity in the face of the threat posed first by Nazism and then by Soviet Communism. The Western offered a language and a way of thinking for defining differences between social classes and races and cultures. You had the rough but virtuous West versus Eastern corruption. You had the individual proprietor versus industrial monopolies. You had the violent culture of men against the Christian culture of women. And again, every weekend people would get their inoculation of this way 
of looking at the world. Now, the Western doesn't just take one form. You can't have 48 different TV shows that have exactly the same plot. Uh, so there are what I would call sub-genres. These are variations on the Western. One uh, of the most famous of these subgenres we'll call the town tamer. The town tamer. High Noon with Gary Cooper uh, is a symbol of this particular outlook. It deals with issues of crime and punishment, conformity and individualism, division and solidarity, ultimately resolved in a shootout. Then there is another sub-genre. These are the epic cattle drives, or the building of the great cattle ranches, or railroads. And these films would explore why business changed in America, why it got bigger and bigger, and what that meant for individual entrepreneurs. And then there was the Cult of the Outlaw film, these were movies that celebrated Western outlaws, and they were very much a critique of corporate society. Then, too, there was the cavalry film. This way you could have war films right here at home. Uh, so it's a merger of the war film and the Western. And then you had the cult of the Indian film, the most famous example before Dances with Wolves was a film called Broken Arrow. This deals with the injustice inflicted against Indians. And let me mention two other formulas that were commonly used. There was the psychological Western. These are more searching films like Red River. Uh, that have very complex characterization. In general, they take a very dim, pessimistic view of their characters and of human possibilities. And then there is a very influential form of Western that I will call the Mexican Western. The Mexican Western. The most famous is the Magnificent Seven. These are about American freedom fighters battling the forces of oppression and alien ideologies in Mexico. You have hard-bitten mercenaries and amoral pragmatists who will break any rules to achieve their goals. So in the 1950s, in particular, there were many films of American cowboys riding to the rescue in Mexico. And that, of course, raises a question that I think we need to talk about for a second. And that is, is the Western genre inherently racist, sexist, and violent? Or not? What do you think? Most Westerns do have gunplay. Most Westerns do portray the ideal American as looking like Gary Cooper. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> In a word? I loved toy guns as a kid. Okay. These films are very powerful in showing that violence is an essential part of the process by which America was formed as a nation. They're very important in teaching us that violence was necessary to defend and enforce democratic values. So they do, I would like to suggest, convey a certain ideology and outlook. Now, the Vietnam War shattered all those themes. The Vietnam War was undertaken for all the same reasons that we had used guns to settle Arizona Territory and Texas. Lyndon Johnson used to refer to his granddad, who wasn't at the Alamo, but who he claimed was, who uh, had 
And this was the reason we had to fight there. But with Vietnam and seven years of protest, the myth of the frontier came to seem to be mere hypocrisy. And a newer generation wanted no part of this myth. But that didn't mean that the Western disappeared. The morality tale Western was replaced by the end of the West, Western. Films like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Little Big Man, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, or The Wild Bunch. These two were Westerns, but with a very different take on what the Western meant. These films showed the military-industrial complex, symbolized by the railroads, as running the country, thwarting the individual, thwarting freedom and initiative. So you could take the Western themes, but then you could play with them and use them to criticize the dominant society. McCabe and Mrs. Miller, a movie that's much worth seeing, I think, can be read as an allegory of American history. It begins with the founding of a town called Presbyterian Church in high hope. So you're founding a city on a hill. And it ends with the cop-out hopelessness of the drug culture. So it's a very soured, pessimistic look at American history, very much shaped by the Vietnam experience. Uh, now, mass audiences no longer respond to the plots or the iconography of the Western. The images of a land as big as the hearts of the men who tamed it, or the lone outcast on horseback, or the founding of the West, the testing of the West, the triumph of the West stories. These don't seem to appeal to a popular audience any longer. Uh, why? Well, I guess the answers all seem pretty self-evident to us today. The stereotypical representations of people of color, particularly Native Americans, Latinos, and Asians, blacks, though very much present in the real West, were excluded from the Western altogether, uh, look very naive and very abhorrent. Further, the Western is considered to be a boy's toy of absolutely uh, no interest to women, though don't tell that to Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. Uh, they're irredeemably masculinist. Further, Westerns appear to legitimate imperialism and colonialism, and Westerns are filled with cliches. So most Americans who've never seen many Westerns assume that Westerns are racist and sexist to their very core. No doubt the decline of the Western also has to do with something about the way Western movies are paced. The Western movie will never confuse itself with MTV. That is, Westerns are epics. They're filled with long silences. They're filled with panoramic shots. And to an audience that likes fast-cut action movies and likes a cluttered screen, who likes movies that look like commercials, to an audience like that, Westerns seem to drag on and on and on. So most audiences are quite resistant to Westerns these days because they seem to have slow moving plots, flat, barren, visually unappealing landscapes. The action seems so small on the screen. It just doesn't seem that interesting to us any longer. But I think there's a deeper reason for the decline of the Western. For a hundred years, the Western was our arch 
archetypal narrative. The Western was our morality play. It was absolutely central to the way that Americans understood themselves, to the way we understood our economic history, our racial history, and our literary history. Westerns, as I've suggested, spoke to Americans' dreams. But today, very few of us have that optimism of the old days. Few of us see ourselves as the inheritors of a great national destiny. And so we no longer mourn the passing of the Old West and its values. Uh, let me go on. Even though it was always a minority experience, pioneering was central to our self-image. All of us in this country, except for Native Americans, had a migratory experience as part of our experience, whether it was voluntary or involuntary. And so migration, the quest for new or at least different things, served as a metaphor a powerful metaphor of mobility and displacement. It belonged to foreign immigrants. It belonged to people who migrated from rural areas to big cities. And so in the Western, this got played out. Where does it get played out for most people today? In movies and popular culture? This experience of displacement, this experience of mobility? in the city, but even more, I think, in gangster movies. Uh, that it's interesting how uh, the stereotyped experience of the godfather has become very, very powerful for Americans now uh, as a symbol. The Western was also a symbol of authentic Americanism. And for many immigrants, to watch a Western, to see John Wayne, was to imagine what to be a real American, an unadulterated American, would be like. And for many years, that seemed something worth striving for. Furthermore, the Western divided society into two polar elements. The Western divided society into whites and non-whites. And if you were an ethnic immigrant, you knew which side you fell on. You fell on the white side. Okay. So these, I think, again, played a very important social role. The Western hero stood between the extremes of bureaucratic order and savage license. Our most popular images today, I think, lie in the gangster film, the urban vigilante film, in the horror and slasher films. And what do those genres tell us about ourselves, do you think? What do you think? That those are the kind of movies we like to see. What kind of image does it give of us, do you think? We are a fearful society. Yeah, I mean, it's a very uh, weird image of a dysfunctional society where everyone is corrupt and violent. It has some of the elements of the Western, but a lot of very depressing elements, too. And yet I'd argue that the key plot conventions of the Westerns have simply been displaced onto new frontiers. The city is now the urban frontier. Outer space is simply another frontier. If you watched Star Wars, you knew it was just the Western, only in a different environment. And spaceships have replaced the horses of the past. But people are just as loyal to their spaceships as they were to their steed. And if the Western itself has fallen on hard times, then country Western music cowboy fashion and rodeos are just as popular as ever. So let me conclude our lecture for today 
by talking for a bit about what our discussion of mass culture says about us and what it says about our outlook. All history consists of stories, or what a, a literary critic would tell you is a narrative. These are simply stories we tell about ourselves. The conventional narrative of American history was a story of onward and upward progress. It was the story of the settlement of an empty continent. It was the story of the development of a thriving economy. It was the story of the growth of a democratic political system. It was the story of the defeat of slavery, the triumph of individualism, the growth of the free market. But this story, which was retold in countless history classes, was not the full story. It omitted or marginalized certain important parts of the American experience, parts that we've been trying to rectify in our class over the past sessions. Slavery, Indian removal, westward expansion, the conquest of half of Mexico, the importance of immigrant labor, including indentured Asian labor, and then in the 20th century, overseas interventions in foreign countries. These elements in American history were omitted. In this course, what we have tried to do is to create a counter-narrative. This story emphasizes the importance of expansion. It also emphasizes the importance of interaction between white and non-white peoples as a shaping force not only in our history but in our culture as well. What we have tried to argue is that the frontier experience was just as central as Frederick Jackson Turner argued, just had a different set of effects. Okay. In other words, the frontier experience created a particular mentality, particular outlook in our society that I think persists even today. So what is it? Many of the characteristics of our society have been attributed to our frontier experience, quite rightly. Our society's violence, our society's preoccupation with guns, our society's intense individualism. This, too, is product of our roaming mobility, frontier environment. But I would like to conclude today by suggesting that this frontier experience has had far deeper cultural and psychological consequences. It has created a distinctive mentality. The United States is peculiarly sensitive about the need for secure boundaries because we live on frontiers, surrounded by frontiers. Our Society has been chronically obsessed with the issue of cultural purity. Again, because on the frontier, you have merging and interaction and hybridities taking place. It was our experience in conquering a frontier, I would argue to you, that helped convince us that we had a special civilizing mission a mission which we have now extended all across the globe, that all people, no matter where they live, should have share in our freedoms and values. And further, our sense that in the United States we need to suppress internal divisions, lest we become vulnerable to outside attack 
This too is, I believe, a product of our frontier experience where you couldn't uh, harbor disloyal elements or you might be massacred. So will the Western return? Well, I would argue to you that the Western has for more than a century met genuine fantasies and genuine psychological needs for Americans. Our preference for military as opposed to social solutions is a product of the Western. Our desire to see our nation as a true community, not simply as a collection of disparate and contending ethnic groups. This too is a need that the Western met. Our sense that our cities are reverting to savagery. This again seems to call out for the vigilante or sheriff who will put things right. So all these things lead me to think that the Western will return. But the point I want to leave you with is that myths are never static. They are never unchanging. And so it is quite likely, in my view, that the Western will return, but in forms that will be somewhat unrecognizable. That is, they will take place in cities or in outer space or somewhere else, but the same themes and archetypes and struggles will take place. Our mass culture industries have shown a remarkable capacity to adapt to our society's changing needs. The discourses of myth are not fixed. They are very much likely to be altered by changing social circumstances. So is the Western dead? The answer is, of course, yes. But it's also dead like the phoenix. It comes back in new forms and will continue to haunt our imagination into the next century. Thank you very much. <laughs>